My name is Kenneth Nagel. I'm the lead designer of Worldwake. For the next hour or 45 minutes or so, I will give you a little breakdown of what Worldwake is to me and how it came to be. So, around a year and a half ago or so, Mark Rosewater came to me. I'm working in R&D. He says, okay, Ken, you've been on design teams. You've been on Morning Touch, Shadow More, Eventide. You made a bunch of Naya cards and Shards of Alara. You're on Conflux Design. We think you are ready to lead design a small set. So I get the reins for World Wake. A little before that, we had just had our first play test of Zendikar, what would become Zendikar. So the very first play test of Zendikar, I open my hand. I'm playing Mark Rosewater. It's just the two of us. I have in my hand a land that comes into play tapped. It's a mountain. It also says, when I enter the battlefield, you may pay a red mana and sacrifice me to deal two damage to target creature or player. So Mark Rosewire, on his turn to play some kind of merfolk looter or something that's totally undercosted because he doesn't know how to cost his cards. And so I am forced to play my turn to come and play tab mountain sacrifice it, deal two damage to his guy. So I lost my mountain, I lost my second land drop, I'm not going to hit my third drop on turn three, and all around it was a pretty crappy feeling from what would become the land set. All right? So that was the very first playtest of Zendikar. We found that it just felt bad when you had to choose between getting your land or getting your spell, the spell lands, all right? Eventually, you know that card, I believe, is Teetering Peaks, and a similar card in World Waste called Smoldering Spires, all right? So there's a lot of challenges in making a land-based set that would play well, because lands are s supposed to be kind of the, the boring parts of the game, all right? They're just like the minerals and the Vespine gas in StarCraft, okay? Or <laughs> the money in Monopoly, you know, just the paper dollar bills, okay? It's not supposed to be all flashy. It's supposed to be the flashy dragons and angels, things like that you're supposed to get excited over, okay? But uh, we went forward, pressed on, we found landfall eventually for Zendikar. Originally it was like a white mana for a 1-1, one -one, and on a landfall, you get plus one, plus one until end of turn. And there are quite a few of these guys. You can probably extrapolate who they are, what the cards they ended up being. And the problem was, when you just play a land to get plus one, plus one, uh, your card kind of goes from being this 90% card to 100% card, okay? So you didn't actually feel like you did anything, okay? And this is what a lot of the cards were like. In order to get some more gameplay, some swinginess to it, that's when we increased it to a plus two, plus two on the landfall creatures, like step links, uh, so that the cards would go from mm, way down in the 50% range of what you could get to the like 200% range, okay? So this is big and swingy, okay? It's important stuff, all right? You can't just have, you know, a planes that gives you a life when it enters the battlefield, and it's all your cards ever do. They make things go up by one, okay? Big numbers, big swings are important parts of the game. So, this was all getting ironed out, okay, to the point where it's time for me to lead World Wake, and so we start our design, and we have a big missing puzzle, a piece of the puzzle, is what's something new that World Wake's going to have, all right? So, this is called a key selling point, a KSP, it's very important in business, okay? Why should I care, okay, about Star Wars Episode Two, okay, or something like that? Is it just more of the same? All right. So, um, at some point, we decided we could have manlands in our set if they would just get rid of them in, in Zendikar, okay? So they had something similar to Crusher Zendikon sitting in Zendikar, and I was like, I want that card. Give it to me. I want the players to be starved of their treetop village and their mutavault and stuff that they don't have anymore. I want them to be starved of it for a whole set, okay, from Zendikar and then 
wham, we'll blow it out the window with uh, when World Wake comes around. This is this is how we named the set World Wake because we we're going to put a lot of man lands in it. The other thing that I stole from Zendikar was Multi Kicker. Multi Kicker was in Zendikar. It was not in World Wake. We play tested a bunch of mechanics. Okay, starting a mechanics phase of our design process. You need some kind of biteable thing, some kind of keyword thing that players can whisper to each other. Okay, it's multi kicker. You can tell your friends about it. You, don't, you actually don't even know what card, what multi kicker is, okay? But you can tell your friends about it. That was in Zendikar. They had a big meeting of stuff in Zendikar, okay? Allies, quests, traps, um, all this stuff. And multi kicker was on the list. Multi kicker got inherited over to World Wake because there was enough stuff already in Zendikar. This is like a godsend, okay? When you're a lead designer of a small set, I inherited multi kicker as my evolution of kicker in Zendikar. Just like man lands are sort of an evolution of land matters, okay, of Zendikar, okay? Just we're just a baby step away from what you saw in the set before us. So we took Multi Kicker, we made 16 cards, I believe, that made it through. We tried to make very, very simple Multi Kicker cards. They were uh, 1C guys that get bigger, plus 1, plus 1. Okay, these guys are kind of like Hydras, very similar to Protein Hydra, I guess. It's a lot of words to write down what a Multi Kicker card does. So we tried to make the very simplest executions possible. It was very important at commons, and then we blew it a little bit up when we went up in rarities, okay? So all the way, we get all the way up to stuff like Comet Storm sitting at Mythic Rare, okay? It's Comet Storm I inherited from Zendikar also because they cut Multi-Kicker. So we have Manlands, we have Multi-Kicker, okay? And after that, we need to make sure players have everything they want for their Zendikar decks, okay? So we continue landfall, we continue allies, we continue quests, we continue traps, okay? We have another planeswalker, okay? A uh, returning planeswalker. And to mix it up, we add a fourth ability to this planeswalker. This is, you know, one step evolution past what you've seen before. So these are all cool things you can use to uh, help sell your set. And eventually, we filled all the stuff in World Wake we thought that was themed, and then we added lots of uh, holes. This is some stuff that's just in there just to be in there. Things like Death Shadow and, I guess, uh, Amulet of Vigor, okay? Things like that. Stuff you can play around with that's not necessarily loudly screaming, I belong in Zendikar, I belong in World Wake. And from there, that's when my job is mostly... Uh, done, some 80% done in development takes a hold of it, and they start ripping through this set, making sure all the cards are fair and fun, make sure that we did put enough allies in the set so people can build an ally deck. Things that, when you're drafting, is it different when you draft with World Wake packs? You know? All this stuff that developers get to worry about that I kind of give them the seeds to work with, and eventually when that's all through, templating comes in, then editing comes in, and all these things, the art director comes in, all the art comes in, because all the cards are finally finished, we see a slideshow, and it looks like what you open in your booster packs. So, that's really quick uh, how World Wake is. I guess I've been answering a lot of questions over the cruise, people just randomly ask me stuff. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer your questions now. Uh, and we'll start with you. you. You're saying that that was how you they finished the development. At how many cards at that after you've got it all, you think done? Do they say, "Oops, we need to do something different there"? So there's probably around 1,000 to 1,200 cards or so you've actually designed when you're making a set. Okay. At the end of the day, you can only print 145, okay, a small expansion is only 145. 60 commons, 40 uncommons, 35 rares, and 10 mythics, okay? Now, some cards in there are super hot, 
and you want to protect, like Comet Storm, I wanted to protect that card and say, we should do this card, it's super duper crazy complicated, reads like algebra math problem, but I wanted to keep that card, okay? Now development will come in and say, okay Ken, that's fine, you have, you know, 30% of your set is super cool, awesome, we can keep all these cards. Some of them are like, you know, nature's claim or something that's just a naturalized, that's just to be there as a naturalize, okay? And that's important to have a naturalize, okay, even though the card isn't super duper cool. And sometimes they'll, they'll throw back a whole bunch of slots like that and say, I need a white trap that hoses red because you made a cool one that is a ricochet trap that redirects and hoses blue cards, so let's do that some more, okay? So then we can change the green trap to hose flyers, but specifically black flyers, okay? Things like that. They'll, they'll come back and say, these cards are doing their job, try harder on these cards, okay? And they'll have pretty specific stuff they want, all right? They're like, we need a red sweeper or something in common, okay? Too many people have too many creatures in play, all right? Change. Yeah, chain reaction or something like that, okay? Did you have to fight to keep the green analog of Comet Storm? Or? So, I put in Comet Storm, and Comet Storm has this XY red red thing going on. We actually would never print XY red red, okay? There is a fireball card that has XY written on it that is way over the head and not fun math, okay? At some point, you're taking Calculus 4, math is not fun anymore, okay? We, magic has a lot of math, we hope it's fun math, so when we get a mechanic like Multigicker that you actually can do the X red red and then fiddle the Y in there too, then we want to make that card. It's important when you have a mechanic that you can make a card to make it, because you might not ever get the chance, okay? So, Strength of the Tajuru is the same thing as Comet Storm, just with plus one, plus one counters in a different color. It is the XY thing going on. We can't make XY cards, except we actually can with multi -figures. So we kind of grabbed it and said, we can make the card. Uh, it's important to make cards when you have the chance. So that's why we made that particular card. Okay? Not that Ken Nagel, Green Mage, really wanted to make Strength of the Tajuru. I really wanted to make Comet Storm. Okay? So that's Strength of the Chijiru. Question? Alright, so you are a super casual green mage. They finally give you Not your set. super casual. Alright, so you're a green mage. You are the you are known as the green mage. They finally gave you your set. Tell me about being able to design your own green cards now. So one thing that I look out for is green cards, and I think it's important for green mages to have cool cards, especially like decision intensive cards, and lots of rewards for playing mono green. Alright, that's why War on Reef the Vastwood was in World Wake, okay, up until the point where uh, development decided that the Valakut cycle, everyone loves Valakut, okay, everyone in the real world loves Valakut, everyone inside loved Valakut, okay, and we thought a super fun card, that's why it's a pre-release card. Every card did what Valakut did, all the colors had one. Okay, the white one was kind of what a Mary does, a planes that is about to get a guy back, okay? And the green one did something I can't remember. It's probably make a 4-4 four, four beast, what Red Paging Baelos does. But we broke that cycle up, and they stole Oran Reef from my set and put it in Zendikar, all right? So that is a, uh, a card for the mono green player gets to play that. So I was like, I need more. So I put in Arbor Elf, Leatherback Veiloth, Omnath Locus of Mana. Okay, these are mono green, uh, has more love cards. Okay, another side of the coin is uh, in order to make powerful green cards, it's kind of hard. Okay, because normally powerful stuff involves screwing with your opponent and messing their stuff up. All right, so uh, I made Terracidon, which is mess with all your opponent's stuff if you want to. Okay. And a lot of green cards make a lot of tokens, like Avenger of Zendikar, Wolfbriar Elemental, okay? Bestial Menace, okay? That's a lot of green cards in one set to make a lot of tokens, but tokens are super fun, everyone loves them, 
and they can be pretty powerful too, because it's hard to solve a lot of tokens with just a single Doom Blade or something. Um, so I personally made sure that green got its due in World Wake. Uh, you can probably thank Mike Turian more as the lead developer. Uh, he gets to make the cards good. I I just make the cards. Okay, so. Uh, Green has a very powerful ally in Mike Tyrion and a powerful creator in me. So, I, I, I didn't want it to be, Worldway comes out, everyone's like, oh, this green stuff. Who, who made these cards? <laughs> Alright? Other question? Just rough percentages of how many you designed made it through. Oh, it was a lot. Worldwake has, I don't know, maybe a third is is me directly put my fingers in the pot. Um, lots of stuff. I mean, not every card is a, a super winner. There's way too many magic cards in the world. Okay, I first picked Kite Sail Apprentice uh, a couple hours ago in a draft because I had Mono White, I had a Mary the Sky Ruin, and I had Armament Master. I needed a core. It was the only one. I didn't make that card thinking someone will first pick this in a draft. <laughs> I made it more that if I just buy a few packs and I like core, okay, then I can use this to build a core deck, okay? Uh, so that card is more doing what core do than trying to be an awesome card all by itself. A better example is core firewalker. Okay, just being an awesome card, okay, and it happens to be a core, all right? Core Firewalker, very, very well-designed card. Uh, I believe it's Matt Place's card, actually not mine. We didn't make Core Firewalker thinking, man, Red is so crazy, we need to beat up Red, okay? It was just, we can put Silver Knight and put Dragon Claw on it, and it's super cool because it hoses Red doubly, and it works great with your own Red spells, okay? It's just a cool card. A lot of people think that cards are surgically engineered, okay, to be uh, used in specific circumstances. Sometimes we just make cool cards just to uh, just so they can exist. Um, I can speak more on this if you prefer. I had a uh, Rexiol, the Risen Deep, was a card that came from Doug Byer, who's a creative person who does the concepting of the cards, all right? That's why Snapping Creeper is a plant, okay? There's this thing where if you're a green creature with Vigilance, you're kind of sitting, you got your spot, and you, like, snap at them, and you stand still. That's kind of the flavor of Vigilance. You can attack and block. It's kind of weird, but he's a person responsible for concepting the cards. He came in with a sketch of a giant legendary Kraken from the style guide of Zendikar saying, we didn't have a place to put this guy in Zendikar because y'all made an octopus called <laughs> Lorthos, the Tidemaker. It was 8-8 eight, eight with 8 things that did 8 things. It was totally octopus flavored. We couldn't put a Kraken on that card even though we wanted to. We, we actually forced them to write octopus on the card. So they said, there are nasty things under the water in Zendikar that will eat you and kill you. We need a Kraken. Can you make one? I said, yes, I can make you a Kraken, Doug Fire. I will put him in my Mythic Rare slot and make an EDH General that I've always wanted to have. I've always wanted an EDH General that can host people who play a lot of Time Walks, okay? Time Stretch, <laughs> I hate that card. I don't know why it's not banned in EDH. So I made a guy that will Island Walk on your face and time stretch using your time stretch because you are a jerk and put it in your deck. <laughs> and then it'll hit you more times while I'm time stretching. So just don't play with uh, time stretches and Rexio won't wreck you so much. That example is a surgically engineered card, okay? Because I wanted to have fun with that card. So most cards are there. Uh, lots of cards are there to be fun. Some cards are there for purpose. Um, Rex Seal is my surgical sledgehammer to hose uh, time-walking blue people in EDH. It's also an example of uh, top-down. 
I suppose it's a top-down thing. Because it started with the art. I mean, that, isn't that That's marvelous? true. He came back and said, I need a giant kraken. I said, well, krakens are blue. Krakens are large. So any kind of sea monster has very large numbers in the bottom right. Okay? 5-8 is pretty big on a 6 mana blue guy. I know EDH journals are more loved if they're gold. Uh, especially two color, I think, is the tipping point. I'm not sure if three color is awesomer than two color, but I made him gold because more people would love him if he's gold. So, is there any others that started with a concept in the set? Um, I look through the style guide whenever I'm designing a set. I'm designing action right now. I'm the lead designer. This will come out a year. It's like next May or so. And I look in the style guide and I try to see this could be a card. There was this something in Zendikar, it had some forest, and then had some, some kind of ice thing, and then it came up, it had grassland, and then it had this mountainous thing, and then on the top was uh, some murky swamps or something. It was like this column of all the basic lands together a little bit, okay? It looked really weird. I thought it was called like a mana pillar or something like that. I tried to make a card like that in the file. It didn't work out. But, uh... Eventually, like the slot for that, I believe, became Quicksand, because we Quicksand is an awesome name card from the past. Has super awesome flavor text, by the way. It's something like, not all deaths are glorious. Sometimes you just fall in a pit and die. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I try to do top-down stuff if I can. I get tons of inspiration for the creative team. Uh, a giant top-down thing that I did get in is Stone Idol Trap, okay? We call this Boulder Trap. I have a, a book that I passed around, it's right there. You can see my uh, different Boulder Trap cards that I had in Zendikar. And one of the first meetings of Zendikar, we're talking about, uh, this is kind of like the world's trying to kill you, okay? Running around trying to find treasures. I was like, oh, like Indiana Jones? He says, yes. It's like, so a giant boulder should come out and try to kill you? He's like, yes. So I made a boulder trap. It got cut from Zendikar for some random reason. I have no idea. So I put it in my set so that there would be a boulder that drops, squishes you, and it keeps coming across. Most people see it as like a ball lightning variant. It has nothing to do with the card at all. It's, uh, it's supposed to be a giant boulder. But it was less words to write 612 than to write card name is indestructible. Because if you think of Boulder, you couldn't really destroy it. So that's a top down card. Uh, yes? Uh, was there a single card that you had to, the most difficult to design? Um, yes. What was it? The most difficult card, I probably shouldn't talk about it, which is Eye of Ugin. Alright? This card is really strange, okay? It's supposed to be really strange, okay? This is a... There's a lot of constraints on this card. I can't tell you all of them, but rest assured, this card was redesigned uh, by me, Rosewater, all these people. Like, we both... We couldn't get it right. We had all these constraints. Development has constraints. It's a creative story point, okay? The Eye of Ugin uh, has trapped the Eldrazi, I believe, or it's some kind of key to it, and Chandra's trying to unlock it. Eventually, Brian Tinsman, the lead designer of Rise of the Eldrazi, coming out in a few months, his design made it through to what you see today. And if it's bewildering and weird, it's supposed to be. Uh, yes? Could you explain the differences in designing uh, a second set that doesn't really have a third set, at least in terms of like, the new play and storyline and so forth? Certainly. So, World Wake is set two of the Zendikar block. I believe we officially advertise Zendikar, World Wake, Rise of the Eldrazi as the Zendikar block, okay, even though the draft format is not that. But since it's mechanically different in Rise, we get to do land stuff in Zendikar World Wake, and we kind of get to blow it out the, the end. We don't have to save anything, okay? When you're Zendikar, and you have a set after you, I say, I need the man lands. Don't do that, 
okay? And I can make them take it out of their set so that I get to do it. When I'm world wake and I don't have a set behind me, I don't really have to care about saving anything. Okay, so I can put dual lands that turn into man lands and stuff and not care that y'all can't figure out something cooler than this because we don't have to think of anything. Rise is going to be different. So was it more designed as like a third set? Would be it was, it's very much more like a third set. You still have to pay attention to everything the first set's doing for you. Make sure that you know all the, the draft archetypes that are there, all the casual decks that people are going to make. Okay? You have to realize uh, all that stuff just like a second set would but like a third set, you don't have to save anything, okay? And the lead designer of the first set, Mark Rosewater, has a block plan. He comes up with, okay, set one is this, set two is this, set three is this. These are the hooks that we can put in these sets that are, make them marketable, okay? Just like people who make Star Wars movies have to make, want to make three of them, you have to put something compelling in all three of your movies, not make Yoda fight in the second one. And, you know, leave me wanting. <laughs> yes? Uh, there's no white quest in World Wake, but there's a quest of each of the other colors. You know, not, I mean, hey, normally you guys would do a full cycle of those. Right, there are a lot of cycles in World Wake. This is because lots of colors get everything. Every color gets allies, every color gets traps, quests, landfall, man lands. Every color gets to do this. Quests in World Wake, we... Uh, I'll say this from my design perspective, they didn't leave us very much room, okay, to do more quests. They did five common ones, I think, uh, in Syndicar, and they all do the same thing. They trigger on a landfall, and then they do something. Then they made some ascensions, okay, that are bigger quests, that are kind of more what I think a quest should be, is do some difficult hoop, okay, some number of times. Now something's turned on, okay? And... We fought hard to make the white one in Zendikar, Luminarch Ascension, and we wanted to just make cool cards. One of the problems with making cycles is, one of the good things is players see them and they're like, oh, I wonder what the white one does, okay? They get kind of excited. Humans are pattern completers, and they want to know what it is. The bad thing is, sometimes, like, crappy cards just make it through when they should be killed, okay? So, we tried to make cool quests without letting, like, lame one, lame cards ride to get a free ride, okay? And we decided we couldn't make a good enough white one. Like, I'm sure you're thinking in your head right now, a cool white quest that we could have put in uh, World Wake instead of some white rare you don't like over Terra Eternal or something. But we, wanted, we only want to make cool cards. We decided that it, wasn't, it was worth not doing a cycle to make the quest we wanted to make. Anyone else? You, you talked about quicksand earlier. How, how do you guys go through the process of just choosing reprints? Do you just find something that fits the block? Alright, so reprints usually happen uh, naturally. So I put Smother in World Wake because I knew that we're making multi-kicker creatures. Multi-kicker creatures cost very little and then they pay a lot of mana, and you get some giant, enormous idiot, okay? And a smother would still kill it. I know that we're pretty powerful man lands, okay? A smother will still kill those. It's kind of a... It was the card at the time that fit best. We could make smother that doesn't have that you-can't-regenerate clause on it, which we kind of take off cards now. But uh, sometimes Riverboat needs to die, and it's cool to have a <laughs> reprint from the past that was hot in the past, it's hot again, and the past is like a resource, okay? So if Smother's the best card for the job, we'll use Smother, okay? Quicksand has a fantastic name, it has some history to it, okay? I remember a lot of blue decks winning because they had Quicksand to protect themselves from orders of the Ebon Hand River Boas. So Quicksand, awesome name, it has top-down flavor, your guy's walking on the ground and falls in the quicksand. Okay? Uh, so, that was our cool reprint uh, land. We had Dryad Arbor in the set for a little while. This is from a future site. It's on the bonus sheet. You believe that we would put it in there. I did put it in there. 
when you can fetch a land in mid-combat and block with a 1-1 one, one at a surprise. So it's like, somehow the, these misty rainforests somehow can block now in a clutch situation. Uh, that gameplay was uh, dubious, I guess. That's why we pulled like Mountain and Island off of Teetering Peaks and all those cards, because it was just made board states really complex when you could fetch various effects. So, Quicksand was the cool land reprint, and Dried Over was not. It got booted. Yes. What about Twitch? So, Twitch is a card that uh, has an effect that we wanted, again, and you can just print a Twiddle effect, alright? We wanted something that you could, like, it was important, sometimes you can mess with your opponent's lands, you can push them over with Brink of Disaster, alright? We just wanted an untap effect. We had one on Tide Force Elemental, but in order to make it uh, good enough to play, if you draft it, you kind of need to have a cantrip written on it. So instead of making a dirty card that says, like, tap and draw a card and not untap, instead of making dirty cards, we try to just keep the clean cards. It has a short name, too, Twitch, like, short verb name. Um, okay. Yes. I mean, uh, what's the uh, Jace the Mind Sculptor story? So... I have a card in there, in this binder here, Jace the Mind Sculptor. We had planned to, when I get the set to design, I actually already have the characters, the, the Planeswalker cards that are going to go in it, okay? I don't get to pick, okay? I'm just the, I'm the gameplay designer. I don't get to design, hey, you know, Liliana's dead, you know? She's not in this set. You know, I, I don't get to make a plot like that. So Jace was going to be in World Wake, we knew, and... The fourth ability is something we had on the on the slate, okay? And since he was the only Planeswalker in the set, uh, we wanted to juice him a little more to make him uh, splashier. And so that was more or less decided uh, basically before I got the set, is that it was going to have Jace. He was going to have four abilities. We have to make a new frame, too. Jace actually has the smallest art, I believe, of any card in the game, except for uh, some unhinged cards. To make jokes about having small art. So, we planned to do that from the beginning. It wasn't my idea. It was, I guess, Mark Rosewater's plan. Okay, we have plans for planeswalkers that are over the top of plans for sets. Alright. Can you, can you do, discuss anything? Huh? Question over here. When did you know that Worldwide would have these two multi Okay, the two multicolored cards in World Wake are my doing. Uh, part of it is, if you have ten Mythic Rares, okay, they're supposed to be the splashiest cards in your whole set, it doesn't work if you say white. It works if you go white, white, blue, blue, black, black, red, red, green, green. That works, right? Everyone feels fair, everyone gets two. If you want to do an artifact or a land, okay, it doesn't work anymore. Okay, so gold is more of a, is like a tool, okay? I know we had a giant gold block and an entire gold set and everyone's sick of it, maybe, but it's more of a tool and that's why I think it works if you do it very seldomly, okay? And M10 has no gold cards, Zendikar has no gold cards. In fact, Zendikar does not even have anything to reward you for playing a two-color deck outside of having gain one life dual land or lose one life, fetch land, okay? And those don't really count, in my opinion. Okay, so, in World Lake, I wanted to have, yes, white and blue like each other, Sajiri so Merfolk, all right? You can also have white and green like each other, Nova Blast Worm, all right? So, I think that's super important for players to know. If you're just starting to play Magic, that's stuff you just gotta, you somehow learn. All right, and it's super loud if you see Rexy Alder is deep. He's a blue-black guy. You can make a blue and black deck. Those are important lessons to teach players. So I thought that we had gone long enough without having gold cards, specifically ally gold stuff, that I put a smattering of it in World Wake. And I think it shows up when you open your sealed pools. It shows up when you draft your cards, too, in a, in a healthy degree. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, so, I haven't really been surprised by anything. I know everyone thinks Jace is totally sick, but we like to have Planeswalkers be totally sick. They're like the face of our entire brand, okay? You, you wouldn't want Yoda to be a weakling in Star Wars, right? Because he's on all the products. So, we, we're happy with our Planeswalkers being awesome. I guess Tectonic Edge is a, is a strong card when I thought that that's not quite what we normally do, is print awesome stone rains, okay? Especially stone rains, you can put in any deck. Um, but I haven't really been overly scared of anything. I know some people in R&D are scared of Amulet of Vigor, okay? The card uh, breaks the game resource-wise in ways that no other card ever has. Those are often dangerous to do. But, we'll see. If, if if everything was safe, all right, if it was like, here's a set, you know, you can't really get excited about anything, okay? You know, Treasure Hunt, it's fair, okay? We know, uh, so you should know too. It's cooler when maybe something's not right. Maybe something got through, all right? And you get to be the player that's like, I showed the whole world. Treasure Hunt's totally sick and broken. I want thousands of dollars, all right? That is something we... I uh, quest, I guess, we give our players. Awesome. Yes? Can you talk for a moment about you personally, like, doing your uh, leading a first design? Alright, so leading a design set is very difficult. I'm not sure that it is uh, what you should do all the time, every day. It's very stressful. You have to oversee other people who are sending you card ideas. You have to be worried about this product is responsible for millions of dollars of revenue to keep this a company afloat, to keep all you guys happy, to keep you opening packs, okay, to keep you talking with your friends, right? If you don't have magic, it's not very fun. Maybe you and your friends don't meet on Friday night or something to play. You know, friendships get hurt. This is all important stuff, okay? So I take it pretty personally, probably unhealthy, an unhealthy degree. Alright, so I was just constantly worried that every single thing wasn't just right, okay? And I probably could have worried a whole lot less. There's a whole lot of people that make sure that the game runs smoothly. That I can't mess it up that bad, I suppose. But, uh... It's nice to lead design a set and to say, here it is, I can do it. I put awesome green cards in the set for you. Thank I'm, huh? Thank you. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I, know, I know there are fans. I know there's people who love uh, oozes and corrupted Zendikon goes in their ooze deck. All right? I, like, I've seen these people. I know they exist, okay? They're not, you know, winning lots of money on our Pro Tour, but they do exist. And you try to hit each of them, okay? Say, so here's a card for you, a card for you, a card for you. Everyone's happy for the most part. Not one single person's overjoyed, but hopefully no one went home crying, okay? They didn't get anything. So, um, it's very, very stressful, but it's a very rewarding job because I get to see everyone having fun. You're on a cruise, you're playing a world wake. Everyone seems to be having a good time. All right. Hooray right, for Cruz. Yes. So, playing with Whirlwind, what was your one high point experience with your uh, breaking Whirlwind cards? Breaking them? You know, no, I mean, when you're uh, in, in gameplay on this cruise. So, I suppose that sometimes you get a design like. Here's a mountain, you can simply tap. It's gonna die, and you shock your opponent. Somewhere you felt bad, okay? And sometimes when you play it and you don't shock your opponent, you felt bad, all right? At some point you're like, it's gonna work, all right? So uh, probably the first time that I went, like land, 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 and then our guys trade, and we got nothing to do, and then I draw my, you know, multi-kicker skitter of lizards, okay? Tap out, 4-4, four, four, come across, all right? I was like, it's going to work, okay? These guys are cool. multi is cool. It wants you to play your lands, so the things you have, your land falling, you're doing it right, okay? That was probably just like, it's going to work. It was fun stuff. 
And I know that there's a lot of, I call them fireballs, okay? There's not a lot of tension. Like, kicker cards are like, do you play it now? Do you want to wait to where you can kick it? multi gear is smart, just do it all the way, okay? <laughs> so I'm like, that's not very many decisions there. It's like, well, some fireballs are also good for magic. So that's when I uh, said, this is going to work. So this is going to be fun. That's pretty close to wrapping that's up. All? Uh, maybe one or two more questions. Has anybody got one? Is there any card that you could talk about that didn't make a set that you wish you felt was which made it is, is So the problem is, if there's a card that I like, I really like, like uh, Comet Storm or Stone Idol Trap or something like that, eventually I will put it in a set. Okay, I work on enough magic sets, and if it's a fun card, it'll get printed eventually. Okay, Beast Show Menace was about seven years in the making. Okay, it's like now we have token technology inside the booster pack. Uh, so Bisho Menace had seven years to get done. The cards that didn't make in World Lake that I still like, I mean, I still have them. They're in my head. They're in my uh, Word documents. They're on our wiki. They will get made someday. All right? Cool magic cards get get made. That's what I can't talk about. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the talk.